from the Computer History Museum in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's the Cube, covering food IT, fork to farm. Brought to you by Western Digital. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in Silicon Valley at the Computer History Museum, which celebrates history, but we're talking about tech in the food and agricultural space. Here at the Food IT Convention, about 350 people. We've got, somebody came all the way from New Zealand. Yeah. We've got food manufacturers. We've got tech people. We've got big company startups. And we have a lot of representatives from academe, which is always excited to, uh, to have them on. So our next guest is Dr. Andy Thulin. He's the Dean of the College of Agriculture, Food, and Environmental Sciences at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, or SLO as we like to call it. <laughs> Welcome. That's right. And Thank all you. the way from Iowa, we have Dr. Wendy Winterstein. She's the Dean of College of Agricultural and Life Sciences at Iowa State. Great. Welcome. Thank you, it's great to be here. Absolutely, so first off, just kind of your impressions of this event. Um, small, intimate affair, everyone actually introduced everyone this morning, which I thought was a pretty interesting mm -hmm. thing. Kind of your first impressions. Oh, it's, a, it's a great environment where you have this mix of of technology and a few production people here, but uh, you know, people thinking about the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's always an exciting place to be. And, and really the environment, having the little uh, set of exhibits uh, where people can go around, visit with uh, entrepreneurs, uh, really a great setting, I think, for the discussion. Yeah, so Wendy, it, 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 when you introduced your portion on the panel, you talked about the scale in which Iowa Right. produces a lot of things, pigs and corns and eggs and chickens. Mm -hmm. And so you've been watching this space for a while. How do you see from your perspective, kind of this technology wave as it hits? Is, is it new? Have we just not been paying attention? Those of us have not been paying attention or is there something different now? Well, I think the speed of adoption, the speed of innovation is increasing clearly, but it's been a long time now that we've had uh, power drive tractors so the farmers can sit and work on the technology in the cab related to their soil mapping or uh, yield monitors and the tractors driving itself. So it, we've had that sort of thing in Iowa for a long time and that continues to be improved upon, uh, but that'd be just one example of what we're seeing. And, and, and obviously, California has a huge agricultural presence. Again, some people know, some people don't. I think the, the valley from top to bottom is something on the order of 500 miles of, of a whole lot of agriculture. So again, is this, you see things changing? Is this more the same kind of? What, no, what absolutely changing. I mean, California produces some over a little over 400 different products. A lot of them, about 100 of them lead the country in terms of the marketplace. So there's, there's a lot of technology with, with the issues of water lack thereof, or cleaning it up, or the, the labor um, challenges that we have for harvesting products, and, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's really turned into quite a challenge, so challenge drives innovation. You know, when you have your back against the wall, and you have, for example, in the strawberry fields, you know, I think a year ago they had $800 million worth of, of labor to produce $2.4 million or billion dollars worth of strawberries. When you think about that, that's a lot of labor. When you can't get that labor in, you're driving by it, you had $300 million where they just weren't able to harvest at all because there was nobody to pick them. Right. And so when you think about that, it's a billion dollars. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a billion dollars that they couldn't get to. You know, and, and that drives innovation. So there's a lot of innovation going in these products. It's pretty interesting, because obviously the water one jumps out, right. especially here in California. Right. You know, we had a really wet winter. The reservoirs are full. In mm -hmm. fact, they're letting water out of the things. I always say we don't have a water problem. We have a water pr <laughs> storage problem. But but this came up earlier today. You know, the, the points of emphasis change, right? The, points of pain change, and, right. and, and labor came up earlier. The number of people with minimum wage laws and, and yes. the immigration stuff that's going on. So again, that's a real concern if you got a billion dollars worth of strawberries sitting in a field that you can't get yeah. to. Yeah, it's, it's a real challenge, and California faces a couple shortages. You know, we got a water shortage, we got a labor shortage, but we also have a talent shortage, and we were talking this morning about the number of young people going to ag colleges. It's up dramatically and we need all that talent and more. I mean, because everyone needs, I mean, all the grain industry, if you will, across the country, all the people that run these farms and ranches and all, they're getting older. And right. who's coming back behind them? And it's a technology-driven industry today. It's not something that you can just, you know, go out and pick it up and start doing it. Right. It takes talent and science and technology to manage these operations. 
So it's interesting, there's been science on the on kind of the genetic engineering, if you will, genetically modified foods for a long time. Monsanto is always in, in, in the newspaper. But, but I also think it's kind of funny, right? Because we've been genetically modifying our food for a long time. Again, drive up and down I-5 and you see the funny looking walnut trees with, that clearly didn't grow that way with a, a solid base on the bottom and a high yield um, mm -hmm. top. So talk about attitudes about this and you know, people want it all. They want organic but they also want it to look beautiful and perfect, be priced right and delivered from a local farmer. There's no simple solution to these problems, right? There's a lot of trade-offs that people have to make based on value. So I wonder if you could talk about how that's evolving, Wendy, that, yeah. from your point of view. Well, certainly as we think about the products we produce in Iowa, uh, we know that producers are willing to produce whatever the consumer would like but they really want to be assured they have a market. So right now in Iowa, we have cage-free uh, eggs being produced, and those are being produced because there's a contract with a buyer. And so I think producers are willing to adapt and uh, address different opportunities in the big market, different segments of that market, if they can see that profit opportunity uh, that will allow them to continue in their business. And from the producer's point of view, I mean, the, the, the sub-theme of this show is, is, is fork to farm, mm -hmm. as opposed to farm to fork, which you think is the logical way, but it's but come up and has been discussed here quite a bit. You know, it's the consumer, again, like they're doing in every business, is demanding what they want, they're willing to pay, and, and, they, and they're very specific in what they want. How, I mean, was this like a sudden wave that hit from the producer point of view, or is this an opportunity, is this a challenge? How is that kind of shifting market dynamics impacting the producers? No, I, I think it's all being driven by technology. I mean, you know, we were talking this morning, I mean, we years ago it was the expert, you know, Wendy's of the world, there they had all the knowledge, and then you had all the consumers listening to them and trusting them. Today, you have, as, as I call it, the, the mama tribe or the soccer tribe or that sort of thing where they're listening to other parents, other mothers in that group. They're listening to uh, you know, the blogs, they're listening to their friends. That's driving the conversation and, and, and there's less science and technology behind it and they don't trust and the transparency thing comes up constantly. So it's, 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 the technology has allowed this just wide open space where now they got so much information how do they process that? Right. How, yeah. how, what's real? What's right. not real? You know, in terms of, of biotech, or is it this, or is it that? You know, is it wholesome? Is it, you know, all these factors. It's funny because you brought up the transparency earlier today mm -hmm. as well. Um, so people know what they're getting. They want to know. They they, they really care. They just don't want to just get whatever generic. ABC like, like they used to. Right, and I think again, there's a certain segment of the market that is very interested in that and companies are responding. Uh, I gave the example of Nestle's and so you get on their web page and you can see the ability to scan the code on a particular product and go and get a lot of information about that product. Uh, back on the web page of that company. And I think that for certain groups of mm -hmm. consumers, that's going to become even more important. And we have to be prepared uh, to meet that demand. So in terms of what's going on at, at your academic institutions, you know, how is the environment changing um, because of technology? We've got these huge macro trends happening, right? Cloud is a, is a big mm -hmm. thing. Edge computing, which is obviously important if you've got to get the cloud to the edge mm -hmm. of the farm. Sensors, big data. Um, you know, being able to collect all this data, I think somebody earlier said it went from no data to now a flood of data. How are you managing that? You know, better analytics. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there's fun stuff like drones and, and some of these other things that can now be applied. How is that working its way into what you're doing in terms of training kind of the next generation of, of entrepreneurs as well as you know, kind of traditional farmers in this space? Well, I think one, first of all, uh, we're seeing a lot more integration between what we do in engineering and what we do in computer science and what we do in agriculture and business. So the overlap and the connection across those disciplines is occurring not just with our faculty but also with our students. Uh, we had a, a group of students at Iowa State before they graduated from the college able to start a company called Scout Pro uh, that was based on using technology to help farmers identify pests in the field uh, and, and that became a company using the technology to do that. And of course that relied on software development as well as a clear understanding of the agronomic and pest management strategy. So, so I think those integrated approaches are occurring more and more. I think at Cal Poly, it's, uh, you know, our, our model has been for over 100 years, learn by doing hands-on learning. Um, 
that's that's key to us. I mean, as you have a as you have a lecture class, you have a lab that goes along with it. So it, they're forced to. We have over forty five to fifty classes, enterprise classes, where you can come in and you can raise, let's say, uh, marigolds, and then you can provide that whole value chain and, and chain and sell it. You can you know uh, you know you can raise broiler chicks, you know, every quarter. For 35 days, you can raise them up, and I mean, 7,000 birds, and there's teams of students in these classes. They can do it, and they manage the whole process, okay? Our winery, uh, for example, it's a bonded winery. They do the whole process. They know how to change the, uh, the pumps and all that. So it's hands-on, but you take that from there up to where those students go out into the industry, um, you know, I, I, our, our university just signed an agreement with, uh, with Amazon for the cloud. So we're moving the whole complex, our IT, to the cloud through that organization. Is that right or wrong? I don't know. But we've got to do things faster, quicker. Right. And just our infrastructure would have cost us millions to do that. But that allows the students, what is it? Apple is only, uh, the, the iPhone is 10 years ten old years tomorrow. Old, right, right. Tomorrow. You know, these kids, that's all they grew up with. So we are constantly having to change our faculty, our leadership teams, constantly have to change to keep up and stay in side by side with, with the technology. So it's changed. Our, our Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and Cal Poly is a partnership with, with the community, with the university. It started in the College of Business, and we have a whole floor of a building in downtown San Luis Obispo, and across the street, we've got 60 apartments for students that are involved in these startups to live there so they can walk across the street and get right engaged. So we're trying to do everything we can. Every university is trying to do everything they can to kind of keep this space flowing and, and, and this enthusiasm with these young people. That's where the change is going to occur. Right, right. Exciting times. It is it exciting. Is. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, so we're going to have to leave it there, but I really want to thank you uh, for stopping by and wish you both safe travels home. Thank you very thank much, you. Jeff. All right. Dr. Thulin, Dr. Winterston, I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching theCUBE. It's Food IT in Mountain View, California. Thanks for watching. We'll be right back after this short break.